My name is Lisa Woodruff and I'm an in-home professional organizer in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I have been in direct sales for over 15 years. I've learned a lot of things over the years in training all of my downline and in the different companies I've been in and just about myself in general. I turned 40 a year ago and I think that was a big catalyst to me trying to kind of figure out who I am and where I'm going and how I can help other people on the planet. If you're over 40, you probably understand what I'm talking about. And if you're not, you will. <laughs> so anyway, my name is Lisa Woodruff and this is the first webinar I often encourage people to go to when they're gonna hear me speak or do training with me. And it's called Branding Yourself. We're gonna unpack a lot of stuff today that you may have never thought relates to the field of direct sales. And I didn't either until I just kind of analytically put it together. And this all came about because I've trained over 200 people in my downline. When I would get on those incentive trips, you know how you work really hard to get on those incentive trips? Well, I was on one, I'd been in the company four or five years, and we were on a cruise all together. Everyone that I was sitting around was making the same amount of money I was making and was at the same leadership level I was at in the company I was in. But when we really started talking about our, what our week was like and what our downline was like and what our sales were like, I found that I was doing about 25% of the work that everyone else was and getting the same results. So for example, I was doing two to three parties or shows a month and they were doing eight to 12. I had you know, 80 to 100 downline, they had 300 to 400 downline. I had two to 300 people on my mailing list, they would have 800 to 1,000 people on their mailing list. And it was way back then, a decade ago, that I started thinking, what is it that I'm doing differently to allow me to have as much success as people who are working four times harder than I am? And when I really reflected on that last year and thought, how can I teach other people to do what I have done? I realized that I never really was just a consultant for the direct sales company I represented. I always started a business like a true business, a Lisa Kelly Woodruff business, and I happened to sell the product that I was representing. So the easiest way for me to explain this to people is I kind of created my own brand. And when I realized I did this was because I'm in the blogging community. And in the blogging community, we talk a lot about how your blog is your brand and what you put out there in social media and online, you're creating a brand for yourself. And that people will follow you as a blogger, they'll follow both you and they'll follow your blog just because they kind of like you or they click with you or there's something about you that they just want to come back for more. And we talk a lot about this whole idea about making ourselves a brand. And I realized I've done that all along. So today I'm gonna to teach you or help you unpack what is your personal brand, what is your target market, and how can you grow your brand to reach more of the market that you wanna target? So these are really, you know, corporate -y type words, you know, not words that we're typically used to hearing when we talk about direct sales. So I wanna unpack what each word means, how it's looked for me, how it might look for you, okay? The first one I'm gonna talk about is branding. Now I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. I have for over 20 years. And if you live in Cincinnati, Ohio, that's where P&G is headquartered. And P&G's big flagship product is Tide. And when you think of Tide, what do you think of in your head? I immediately see an orange box with a yellow swirl on it. I see that big white Tide in the middle. I think of a higher end laundry detergent. I think of something that will always get your clothes clean. Now, I'm not saying I've used Tide for a long time or that that's my experience with Tide, but that is what is in my brain about what Tide is just because of how much media I've been exposed to in my lifetime and Tide commercials of those dirty white t-shirts coming out brilliantly, sparkly clean. You know, I mean, that's just what I've, just what I've seen. Same with Coca-Cola. If I think of Coca-Cola immediately, I think of a red logo with a nice white swoosh through it. I think of that classic Coke shaped bottle. I think of the polar bears at Christmas time, you know, that commercial that they have. I think of that 1980s retro 70s commercial they had where everybody was going out in that field and drinking Coca-Cola. These are things I think of when I hear the word Coca-Cola. So companies work really, really hard and they spend a bazillion dollars so that when you think of Tide and when you think of Coke, you have certain images in your head. 
they're very purposeful about it. It's very planned. There is nothing to chance there. They do focus groups. And the company that you represent has done the same thing for your direct sales company. I was with a direct sales company. I signed up in their 10th year of business and I was with them through their 22nd. And over the years, they kind of rebranded themselves. And it was really cool every time they came up with a new tagline or they changed the logo a little bit to see how much effort they put into the branding of that market. So if you're in a company that's been in business maybe five years or less, your company is still working on what their brand is gonna be for sure. They haven't really totally zeroed in on it. But let's go with a really old classic one like Mary Kay. Okay, when you think of Mary Kay, I think of the pink Cadillac. I mean, it just comes to my head pink, and I think, oh yeah, you can get a Cadillac. Those are the things I think of with Mary Kay, along with other thoughts. Mary Kay has done a really good job of branding themselves with that pink Cadillac. And they've done a really good job branding themselves with the message that they are there to reach every woman, every age, every skin type, every woman. Their target market literally is anyone with skin. And if you go up to a Mary Kay consultant and you ask them, what's your target market? They will tell you, anyone with skin. And I will tell you, no, it is not. That is the corporate company Mary Kay's target market. Absolutely, yes it is, they've worked really hard for that. But you as a consultant for that company, there is no way that your target can be every single human on the planet with skin. It's not a target, it's a population, you know what I mean? So when we think about branding, we not only think about the company that we represent and the awesome brand that they're develop, they've developed, but now I want us to think about ourselves as being our own little brands within that company. Okay, so that's really crazy, Lisa. I mean, I do these trainings and I get so excited and people get so excited and they're like, yes, I've never heard this before. You're right, this makes sense. But I also kind of think I'm a little crazy because I'm saying that we're gonna be our own brands inside of our direct sales companies, right? So then what the heck is a brand if we're not, we're not all gonna have our own colors and our own logos and our own taglines, right? So let's take the definition of brand and let's make it a little bit simpler. And let's call it our online representation. What we want people to think of when they think of us as a person. It's kind of like your character. You know, like, what do you want people to say about you? So we are going to start to be really consistent and purposeful with the message that we display both online and in person. So online is gonna include a blog if you have one, your Facebook page, your newsletter, your YouTube videos, what you pin on Pinterest. In person is gonna be your social interactions with people, your parties, your shows that you do, what you do at a vendor event, how you spend your free time, what you share with people. All of those things. That's why I say it's kind of like your character because it really is who you are, okay? So let's think about what is your brand. The easiest way to figure out if you already have a brand or if you don't is to, is to think about are you a billboard for the company you represent or are you in business for yourself? And there's a real easy way to tell this. If people come to shop from you and let's say they're gonna buy Avon products, they wanna get some Avon products from you are they coming to shop from you because they've figured out what they want from Avon, they've done a Google search, or they've been a customer of yours, and they're like, she is our Avon girl, I get Avon from her. Or are they thinking, oh, I've got this birthday party coming up and my grandparents' anniversary, and I just don't know what to do about those, but I will go to my Avon rep because they always help me solve this problem. If it's the first thing, where they already know what they wanna buy, they've already picked it out, they know what the special is, and they just wanna get more of whatever it is you're selling, you really are just a billboard for the company you represent. You've done a good job of making people realize, yes, you represent this product and you're the distributor and they can buy from you. If they're coming to you, not necessarily totally sure with what they want, but they know you can help them find it using your product, you are in business for yourself. Do you see the difference? Are they coming for the product or are they coming for your help? So let's look at how we would unpack creating a brand. 
The first place to look at what kind of a representation you have of yourself is to look at your social media. Look at the kind of posts you put on Facebook and look more importantly at the posts that get a lot of likes and a lot of comments. What are the things that your family and friends and the people that you interact with, what do they like? And what things do they kind of let roll through their newsfeed and they don't comment and they don't like? It's not that they don't like them, but it's not really what's engaging them with you. The other big thing in the blogging community is to create a community and to create this social media is supposed to create this community of like-minded people for you to interact with people and for them to interact with you and for you to then respond to them in that interaction. Like today, my blog is organized365.com. And this morning, I have a Facebook group, Organized 365, and in there, somebody said, are you going to be doing blog posts on holiday organization? And I really wasn't. I was going to do one or two, but not a lot, um, because I feel like all the other organizers do that. I try to do different stuff. So I said, yeah, I'm going to do a couple. What do you want to see? And they gave me a list of five things that they wanted to see specifically organized in at the holiday time. Well, you better bet that I am now writing five blog posts about organizing those specific things. Because even though I had in my mind what I would be blogging about in November and December, it really doesn't matter if my community wants to hear how to organize their stuff. The other thing I've learned as a blogger is there can be a lot of blogs on the same exact topic. So there are a lot of other Avon reps on your street or whatever, but your job as an Avon rep is to tell your customers how to use the products best or how to solve their problem. People like to do work with you for whatever reason. They like your personality. They like the hours that you work. They like your stories. They like your punctuality. They just like something about you. So what I found is it doesn't matter if every other organizational blogger out there is talking about organizing your holiday stuff. My readers want to hear how I organize it. They want my spin on it. They want my humor. They just want the way that I write even if it's, if it's the same exact information. They want to hear it from me. And your customers are the same way. They want to hear it from you. So really take notice about what they're liking and what they're commenting on. Now the next thing you should do is look at your family of origin history. When I started looking at, um, I always dabble with going back into teaching or going back into working for other people and it really doesn't last very long and then I'm back out on my own starting some brand new business. And I'm constantly starting new businesses and you know just out there being an entrepreneur, trying things differently, reinventing the wheel. I like to reinvent the wheel and do things the hard way apparently. I love to get out there and do it and then turn around and simplify it and organize it and teach it to people so that they can do it faster and quicker right behind me. It's just something I've always, always done. And when I started looking at my family, I am the first generation to go to college on my dad's side, but I am the fourth generation to go to college on my mom's side, which means my great grandmother went to college during the depression. That's kind of unheard of that all the women all the way back would have college degrees. Now, not only did they have college degrees, they all owned their own businesses. So even though my grandmother had a college degree in teaching, which she did teach a little bit, she also owned four different businesses, again, during the Great Depression and right after. She just was, you know, a spunky woman that had a lot of businesses. My grandmother was the same way. My mother was the same way. All right, well, let's look over on my dad's side. Same way, all the way back, four generations, owned their own businesses, started in a business, worked up to ownership every single time. Well, it stands to reason that my sister and I are probably going to own our own businesses or we're going to be entrepreneurs. So you need to look at that. It doesn't say that you're necessarily going to follow in your family's footsteps, but if you've got that much entrepreneurial blood in your genealogy, odds are you are. I mean, odds are you aren't all of a sudden going to become, you know, an airplane mechanic. No, we're not wired that way. That's not how our brains work. Obviously, we love to fly on airplanes, but that's just not going to be our thing. So you need to then figure out what is your thing? Because I honestly, truly in my gut feel that direct sales can work for every single woman. I think it is such an awesome, awesome opportunity and way to grow a business. But it works best if you can find your spin on it and if you can find your passion to bring out in that. So how the heck do we do that? Let's find our market and then I'll tell you how we hit them with our passion and our brand. So when we think about marketing, 
we're going to think about who our target is. And I will tell you, the first time you start thinking about narrowing in on a certain group of people to sell your product to, you're going to get cold sweats. And here's why. You're going to be afraid that if you target in on these 20 people over here, someone in that group of 20 people over there might be interested in your product and you're going to lose a sale, you're going to lose a party, you're going to lose a recruit. I thought it too. And I kept saying to my sister, she is a marketing person, and she kept saying, Lisa, hope is not a strategy and everyone is not your target market. I'm like, but they could be. Like, you know, like if I could position it right and if I did my 30 second commercial right and if I followed up consistently and if I stood behind him in line and talked to him about my business. And my sister's like, okay, this is not efficient. This is not effective. You cannot be everything to everyone. You've got to pick a group and go after that group. And she was so right. So let me give you an example outside of direct sales. When I started my professional organizing business 18 months ago, I thought professional organizer, I can organize anything. And I probably can. I mean, if you put me in a room and it's unorganized, if it's in an office building or in a home or in a retirement community or in an RV, yes, I'm going to be able to organize it because I'm just crazy and anal. I love to organize. But it's not my passion to organize RVs and it's not my passion to go into a um, corporate setting and figure out how to organize corporate people in their corporate office. I mean, that's just not my thing. When I really get down to it, I am super, super passionate about organizing two kinds of people. One is a woman who is at home and running a home-based business. I think I can really make her more efficient at running that business and organizing the home for any woman, especially that has children. So I primarily like to organize people's master closets, kitchens, laundry rooms, and home offices. I feel like if you let me in your house and you let me organize those four spaces, it will dramatically change your life as a woman because your husband and your kids are not gonna mess up your side of the master closet. They don't even know what the laundry room is. That's why you're in there all the time. They're not gonna mess up the home office generally and the kitchen pretty much they'll leave to how you set it up and you might just have to tweak it. So if you can get those four areas organized in a, a woman's house, her life functions so much better, whether she works in the home or out of the home. Now I could do a whole home organization. I could do garages, basements, attics, kids rooms, laundry room. I've done them all, but those areas don't stay as clean and organized as the first four that I mentioned. And they generally need to be retweaked and things like that. So that is what I'm super, super passionate about. So when I really realized that those were the people that I wanted to get in touch with, I started doing speaking engagements and I didn't speak to just anybody. I would speak either to networking groups of women or moms groups. Those are the two people that I primarily target. I rarely speak to men. There, I don't think I've ever had a man in the audience actually. Um, Oh, no, that's not true. Realtors. I will speak to realtors and there are men in that off audience, but really they're just a conduit to get to more women is what they are. So when I started doing that, I thought, oh, geez, but what if I get a speaking opportunity for X, Y, Z? Well, if they call you and they want you to speak and they're going to pay, do it. You know, if somebody not in your target market wants to have a party, go do the party. I mean, we're not crazy, right? But you're not going to put all your time and your effort in going after teenagers if you want to organize women with children, right? Now, the second thing that this does is when you have a target market, this also allows you to let opportunities go without guilt. Like before I decided that I had a target market, every single opportunity that came through email or over a webinar or in a training or online all got put on my to-do list. It was like, I'll get to it someday and I'll try that idea because that might result in a something, a sale, right? And so I found myself chasing my tail. So I would get an email that would say, you should do parties for teenagers. I'm like, oh, that's great. Teenagers need to get organized. I'll do a party for teenagers, which are not my target market. So I would spend the entire day figuring out how I could sell my product to teenagers, how to organize it, setting up a little flyer sheet, kids sheets. You see what I'm saying? I wasted a whole entire day. Maybe I did or didn't do that event, but ultimately that wasn't who I wanted to continue to do events for. So when you really start going after your target market, I could see opportunities come through like that 
and either pass them off to my downline or just let them flow right through and go, that is an awesome opportunity, but it's not perfect for me and my business. I want to talk to you a little bit about networking. Once you decide what your target market is, you're going to have to go out and reach that market more specifically. It is a little bit more work, but the work is exponentially magnified. So let's say typically you sign up in a direct sales company and they say to make your Frank list or make your list of 100 or make a list of everybody that you know that has a pulse, right? And you have to call every single person you've ever met and tell them about your business and see if they want to either buy it, become a consultant or have a party. And I understand the logic behind that. And it's not a bad thing to do, especially when you first start, because then everybody does kind of know what you're doing. And even if they're not interested, they can refer people to you, right? Here's a hint. When you get super, super specific about who it is that you want to reach, like I want to reach women who either work from home or work away from home that have children and help them get organized, then like I told you, there are men in my audience, they're not my target audience, but they know exactly the target that I'm trying to reach and they do refer me people because they know that I'm so super clear in what I'm trying to reach. I'm not trying to sell the man on organizing the garage, you know, and trying to get him as a client, which, is ha which has happened a couple of times, but it wasn't what I was going for. And so you end up getting more referrals from people when you know exactly the target market that you're trying to reach. But you're going to need to do some networking wherever this target market is. So for me, I need to go to mom's groups. I need to be in networking groups of direct sales professionals during the day. Chamber of Commerce events are where a lot of entrepreneurs are. Um, and lunch and learns are great for me because professional women who work have lunch, ironically, in an office usually. And I could do a quick show you know, or presentation during that lunchtime, they can find out about my services and then I can help them on the weekend or even while they're at work, I will organize their homes. But what you need to realize once you're in those networking situations and you're with your target market is that you are in direct sales, not in your face sales. Even though we are like so, so ingrained and in what is our 30 second commercial and I've got to have that ready. And when they say, what do you do? I know exactly what I do and I'm going to give them that 30 second commercial. There is a time and place for that, and that is a great confidence booster and helps you really get started your first year in business. But networking is really about getting to know each other, getting to know them as much as they're getting to know you. How can you help them? And the more you focus on helping other people within your networking group, if you're in a networking group that meets monthly or every other week, don't worry, it'll come back around to you. But the more you focus on them, the more they're going to end up focusing on you. Now, here's a couple of questions that are going to really help you figure out what your target market is and what your brand is. And I want you to think about what service do you provide that no one else is providing. When I was selling scrapbooking supplies, there were two things that I was offering that the other people in the city were not offering, and I didn't really realize it until I went back and analyzed it. The first one was people on average would get a complete scrapbook done at my workshops in three, three sessions. So if you followed my plan, you could have four albums done in a year. And if you've ever scrapbooked before or put pictures into an album, that's really not common. Like right now I'm working on 17 albums for a senator who's passed away in the state of Ohio. And I'm going to get these albums done in probably two to three months. That's not normal. I'm not normal. I never said I was normal. But I am really efficient and effective and I'm really good at streamlining things and creating systems. And everyone still had a blast at my workshops. I mean, they were still, we had music going, we had snacks, everybody was laughing, some people weren't working at all. But if you wanted to get your album done, you knew you could come to me and you could get it done. The second thing I did was, I'm crazy and organized and I love to organize stuff. So I don't like standing around at a five hour workshop doing nothing. So I liked to organize everybody's scrapbooking supplies. So one day, you know, somebody was a hot mess and I was like, hey, do you mind if I just sit here on the floor and like organize your stickers and paper? Nope, 
Didn't mind at all. So I totally organized it. Next workshop. Hey, do you mind if I organize yours? Pretty soon, every single person's scrapbooking supplies were organized exactly the same way because I had organized everybody's scrapbooking supplies. So when a new person would end up coming to the workshop and they would, you know, they would say, oh, I can't find blah, blah, blah. Everybody would go, that's okay. Lisa will come over and organize you. And I was like, okay. So I went and I would organize all their supplies. Or if somebody said, I don't know where my blah, blah, blah is, everyone in unison would say, oh, it's in the, and they would tell them exactly where it is because everybody's scrapbooking supplies were organized exactly the same way. So those were two services I was providing that nobody else was providing in the city, but I didn't really realize it. So what service are you providing that no one else is providing. The second thing is, what story do you have a burning desire to share? Is there something that you are just super passionate about, a cause that you just love to talk about and really people have to stop you from talking about it? A couple of years, well, before we had children, I would talk a lot about infertility. And then when we adopted our children, I would talk a lot about adoption. And then as our children were little, I would talk a lot about, you know, the extra challenges that they had as children that ended up being learning disabilities and food allergies and things like that. And I would share all of this information and I would help people with their adoptions and I would help people with their kids that had special needs and I would help them find resources. And at those times in my life, I was super, super passionate about sharing that information. At this point in time, when my kids are 12 and 13, and you know, they're starting into their adolescence, I'm not super passionate about sharing any of that anymore. I mean, if, if one of my close friends needs help, yes, I will go into it. But I just don't have the passion behind those discussions that I used to when I was in the thick of that. So do you have a story that you just, you just tell people and it draws people into you and you just really minister to them and help them through sharing your personal experience. And if you do have that story, how public do you want to be about that? Is that something you just share in person at a workshop? Is that something that you wouldn't mind sharing on a blog? Is that something that you wouldn't mind being quoted in Newsweek about? How public do you want that information to be so that you can reach more and more people because you have such a burning desire to share this story. Okay, so hopefully those two questions really got you thinking about what your target market is and what your brand is. Now I wanna break the target market down into two sections. You have this target market I keep telling you about that you're gonna go after, which for me is the working woman, whether she's working at home or working in an office and she has children. But then there's your warm market, and that's the one that direct sales typically is really good about teaching you to go after. Those are the people you bump into at the grocery store and the teller that you see all the time at the bank and the kids sporting, at the kids' sporting events, the parents that are there, or the people in the PTA with you. So you do have that warm market still. You don't want to forget about them. So you have your target market and you have your warm market. So the questions I want you to ask yourself are, who are you, who is your target audience, and how much do you want to share to build your community? I want to thank you so much for being on this call with me. And I want to tell you just a couple of things about the services that I offer to people. And then I have plenty of time to sit here and answer any questions that you guys have afterwards. I have a coaching call that I do that is an hour long and I send you out a survey and you answer it. And we volley back and forth a little bit on email. And then it's a one hour coaching call that's $100 that I help you figure out what your brand is and what your target market is. And then the second thing that I offer is the successful direct sales membership site. Hopefully you're all over on my free Facebook page. You just type in successful direct sales and I'll add you to that Facebook group where we talk about branding ourselves and having a target market. But I have created online a membership site that is $75 for the year and it has 36 videos. And in there are my videos about how to brand yourself and then also all of the stuff that I used to teach my downline when I was in direct sales and I was a leader. 
So how to be a leader, how to organize your business, how to do your email, how to have an online presence, all of those things are in there. And if you go to SuccessfulDirectSales.com, you can watch a video that'll take you through what is in all of those different videos so you can see before you sign up. And I add two to three new videos per month.